Photography Chat with Merlin. Photography Chat with Merlin. Welcome to another episode of the Photography Chat. We're uh, season three, episode 29 with uh, Jamie Swick. We are almost at our 100th episode. You are, you're, you're the 98th episode today of the chat in total. So <laughs> it's getting close um, to the, uh, the final yeah. countdown for 100. Nice. Good for you. Thank you. That intro, by the way, has a very good, like, kind of like 90s, spooky tv show by where there would be like an ensemble cast and i really like that thank you yeah uh, a friend of mine mocha only he put it together for me um he's nice. a he's a rapper here from uh vancouver that has uh he's like a prolific producer as well he makes like so much music oh. all the time and um this year i decided i wanted to like step up the production of the chat a little bit and uh so i bought like this this crazy like mixing thingy here that like oh, lets wow. me play the noises and stuff and use these like <laughs> crazy microphones and shit um but yeah he sent me a bunch and i'm like i like that one because it had that spooky like kind of cartoon vibe to it and i was like yeah i like that yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely reminded me of like my childhood and like early teenage tv show years so yeah yeah um, like saturday morning cartoons kind of shit yeah absolutely like kind of um it's one show in particular. I'm losing it right now, but something that was obviously formative, if I'm remembering at this point. What, uh, like, Are You Afraid of the Dark? That one? Or is that more kids? Oh, thing? definitely has Are You Afraid of the Dark vibe. Yeah, yeah that, that was a classic. Has that yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can see like us having a little fire between us right now. <laughs> what, what, was their, what was their club called? Because they had like a name to the club where it's like, and now for like another oh. night of the like blah, blah, blah club. If you weren't putting me on the spot, I think I would know it like that <laughs> because I'm on the spot. I don't know. That's fair. That's fair. I'm sorry maybe for putting somebody, you on the spot. Li- maybe somebody listening remembers, but it had a great name. That was definitely part of my like identity as a kid. Probably still, actually. Here, wait. Let, let, let me see if I can find it. I might be able to track it down here. Are you afraid of the dark intro? I, I swear it was called like Fireside something. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Um, maybe the intro will have it here. Yeah, this is some spooky shit. <laughs> For like fourth grader? <laughs> right? Oh, but it doesn't have like. Oh, this is the intro music. That wasn't it. I I can see what you meant, though, (laughs) by, like, it definitely had, like, a bit of, uh, yeah. That kind of, like, soft, spacey sound that sounds like you'd be in an old building, which is, I mean, that's right up my alley. Wait, wait, I think I found the one here. Oh, this is just the music part. <laughs> I, I thought it was gonna like have the fire part. Oh my god, it's got a terrible CGI in it too. I'm so glad you couldn't see that. Anyways, um, <clears throat> back to the chat. So, Jamie, do you want to take a moment to introduce yourself to the crowd? <laughs> um, hello, people who are watching. It's very sweet. Um, my name is James Wick. Um, I am probably known best for my Polaroid, but I'm a film photographer and multidisciplinary artist, really, and uh, and a writer. And I live in the Northwest. That's awesome. I don't know how deep I don't know how deep you want me to go. I mean, we could go like I could go all day. <laughs> you can go as deep as you want, like you know, astrology sign, favorite hobbies, you know. <laughs> um, I'm Leo. My birthday is this weekend, oh, and. Cool. I'm very excited about that. <laughs> Happy birthday. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's going to be good. I'm actually kicking off a new project um, right on my birthday. So I'm looking forward to having a new little thing to look forward to. What's the project going to be? Um, if you I, talk about it. 
Yeah, um, I guess this is the first time I'll really, really chat about it. A few months ago, I don't know if you're familiar or if other people are familiar with Rebecca Norris Webb, who is a photographer who is sort of like based out of the heartland of America with a lot of her work. Um, she and her husband have a prolific amount of photography books, but um, she has one called Night Calls, which follows the path of her father, which kind of looks at his history as a um, as a delivery doctor in the rural Midwest back in, I want to say, the 60s. I could be wrong about the dates, but um, she decides to trace his footsteps and she was really talking about how that was her first landscape as a child and really got the wheels turning in my mind. Like, what is my first landscape? And what does the first landscape mean to a person? Um, how do we identify with those or become formed through, I don't know, just like the immensity <laughs> of a first landscape? And where do we turn as adults to look back on that for better or for worse. So I live 3,000 miles away from where I grew up, and I don't go there often for a number of reasons, but uh, an opportunity kind of just landed in my lap to go back, and I've decided I have to look at what my first landscape means because it has informed a lot of my life in some really um, incredible and positive ways, but there's also been things that are kind of ghostly that I want to figure out as well within that realm. And pretty excited. I'm, I'm excited to be challenged in a way I didn't think I would challenge myself. That sounds like a really interesting project. I'm excited to see uh, what you come up with it. Thanks. Yeah. I have a limited window, so I only have like two weeks to do it. But <laughs> fingers crossed I can prioritize my time appropriately. Yeah. You just got to stay a bit focused. And uh, yeah. I, I like I like the spooky angle. Where, it's like yeah. we're starting off with like a spooky start to this episode. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> it's, it's funny how, yeah, I mean, I kind of naturally gravitate toward that stuff, but to do it with like basically a bunch of strangers is sort of a funny approach. <laughs> 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 but friendly strangers. So. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's, it's fun to uh, to just experience new things with strangers, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, keeps life interesting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so how, how did you get started with like photography and, and Pol was it Polaroids first or did you have like a different practice before? Or? Um, boy, it's really been, it's really been like a, a whole lifetime um, of photography. I, some of the people that I'm actually going to be with this next two week period are the people who really laid that foundation for me. Um, my mother's parents were pretty adventurous people and they always had cameras around. So they were always, you know, they'd hand you a camera left and right. It didn't matter what you were taking pictures of, but I had over 30 years of really loving to have this medium available to me. And when I was in high school, we had a really great art program. So I learned how to do like traditional darkroom printing. We had very formal courses in that and, it, it never bored me. It was always the thing I wanted to come back to. And when all the other art forms were very, very interesting to me and actually were more of my like focus at the time, that was the thing that I could be very independent with. And that's what I really enjoyed about that. And um, I don't think that that's ever left me. That's sort of how I, I operate to begin with. But when I reached my 20s, I started to really look at that as a tool that I could use to my advantage within the arts rather than be just some sort of passive um, part of myself, I guess you could say. Um, and it started to understand that you could hone that independence with the craft as a, a more complete whole. And um, you know, I studied some photography courses throughout college and it never, I don't know, it just didn't have the sticking power that I think it does today for me. I think yeah. I had to have this sort of um, separation from an expectation as a young person to step into it and find my own voice within that. And that was sort of how the Polaroid thing was born. Um, it was like 13, I think it's 13 years ago now, 2009. 
a while, <laughs> but okay. um, I uh, I was on a trip and I didn't have any cameras and I was kind of kicking myself for that when I respond or when, when I got back from that and. I was like, what's the best way for me to approach something of wanting to have a camera with me at all times? It's instant film. <laughs> like, it's such a no brainer. But that also was at the same time where Polaroid is sort of in its downward spiral. So I came in as like an obsessive photographer, sort of right at the wrong time. <laughs> um, <laughs> not totally at the wrong time. There is still film, obviously, but um, it was waning in its popularity, I suppose. And I don't know, tenacity or um, my stubbornness <laughs> and probably the just ethereal quality of Polaroid kept me going and kept me intrigued and kept me wanting to seek out what was going to become more and more scarce. And thankfully, you know, now it's abundant and I, you can almost throw a rock and hit some Polaroid song at this point. But I think the specialness that came from not being able to have access to it at every moment of every day sort of created a, a mystique that really intrigued me and definitely motivated me to want to find more when I could. And, um, for a lot of reasons, like I went in and out with different mediums or, um, different instant film formats, you know, whether it's Polaroid or Instax or expired stuff or impossible projects. But, um, I stuck with it and, Thankfully so, because I really genuinely love this film format, and I think it is truly magical. Like, there's not much else in the art world with photography other than a few, like, very particular processes that are just as magical to me as Polaroid is. And who wouldn't want to feel that way? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I, I have to agree. I, I think it's a very magical material, too, and, like, that's one of the reasons why I fell in love with it, um, as well. Um, dang, see, like you, you started like just as they were like going down the, the fucking tubes. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so were you able to get in on like the impossible pioneer stuff, uh, in, in one or two or. Yeah. Um, that was when I was probably the most poor and definitely should not have been participating <laughs> 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 there's like, there's very very little time I could say where I was like that's a good idea financially but the desire was there you know and because of that too like it's sort of been this like wild roller coaster of trust and it feels like it's a relationship to me at this point the film doesn't feel like it's just this like inanimate object and that this business as we know it as for right now, but like um, the ingenuity and the trust on either side of, of that coin with consumers and people who want to save something that is very precious feels like sort of a, I don't know, it's not an unrequited romance, but it's sort of like a, <laughs> a very trustworthy long friendship. And I'm glad for that. I, I feel fortunate to have been, um, I guess able to see it progress and to trust that eventually it would probably be good. And, you know, here we are today. So, um, it's not this like singular thing. It feels very much like part of who I am as a person to use this medium and to have been patient through all of its different iterations over the last decade. Um, which is cool. I can't say that about other, um, other art forms that I have participated in or worked in and, I don't know if I'll ever see another one quite like it. No, I, I don't think we will. Like there's kind of a crazy magic to Polaroid when you look at the history of like all of the different artists that were involved with instant film throughout the the ages. Like it spans yeah. so many different creative practices, so many different kinds of different photographers. Um, it's just, it's wild. Like how rich the history of the medium is and that just kind of like adds to the magic of it um mm -hmm. and cromwell says stay poor shoe polaroid right <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> yes that's definitely a, um, um, a lifestyle <laughs> <laughs> exactly 
Like there's the whole like stay broke shoot film, but like I think like stay broke shoot Polaroid is like a that's, that's a whole different level of poor. It's, it's very true. Yeah. <laughs> I just ordered film today and I was like, oh, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, I every time I do a film order, I'm just like, Ugh. but luckily I, I got a U.S. postal box um, in Point Roberts, so oh. that makes my mm-hmm. like film purchases a little less stingy because yeah. every time I get teased with that seventy five dollars or more, it gets free shipping. Not if you're in Canada, though. It's like you know, right? You pay yeah. <laughs> almost as much as your order is for shipping. I know um, it's oh, cause I can't even imagine. Oh, yeah, it's 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 kind of brutal, but I love it. Like, there's um, it's it's one of my favorite mediums uh, as well. Like, it's just um, yeah, something about like also being able to hand someone an an instant photo. Yeah. Um. And and like I know a lot of people shit on like. The, the new Polaroid because it's the colors aren't as good or this or that or like whatever insert I'm upset about something here comment um but I kind of I might be alone on this but I kind of like the jankiness of it because it just sort mm. of it adds to the magic of it because you don't really you don't really know what you're going to expect sometimes so it's just like I don't know if, if I wanted a perfect instant picture every time i would use instax but you know sometimes yeah you want to like you know roll the dice and see what polaroid's gonna give you (laughs) there's still a little bit of um i don't know i guess i i have like my my qualms with some of the the jankiness and at the same time i know that if i'm patient it almost works itself out within the chemistry. So I have to be, it's it's very much like a patience game for me with this, with this medium, because um, the desire to, it's so funny because, you know, it's this instant format, like within five minutes, you can usually see what you're doing. And I'm willing to wait like a year and a half for film to expire so that I can get a tonality that I'm searching for and trying to maintain a consistency with. And, um, I love that ironic twist. Um, yeah, I like what Crom said. Yeah, perfection is such a bore. <laughs> like, yeah, it surprised me. I like the, that. Yeah, and and I think too that the, the comparison can't even be made between the two, you know, major brands here because they're worlds apart. You know, this brand might have a name that has been bought and and has recognition, but at the same time, it, at its heart, I think it's still very much an experiment and the fact that people still want to participate in the experiment and they're willing to um, make, you know, the sacrifice of an imperfect picture, which would be so boring if, if that were the case that, um, uh, sorry, Casey, Casey's comment distracted me just a little, uh, that it's really cool that people want to see that through, you know, they want to see this thing flourish so that all of us get to experience that. And, um, I don't know of a group of people in an art medium. I've never met another group in my entire life who's had that sort of resilience and this, the community of those people, I think it's like, I mean, it's, it's absolutely incredible. It's super inspiring to see that many people be like, okay, I'm on board. We'll see what happens, but we trust that it'll always be, something that we can work with. And um, I think it's up to the artist then to kind of present that challenge to themselves to say, if I'm not happy with that, what am I going to do to make it something of my own? And there's not a lot of other film stuff that kind of let you do that. No, no, there really isn't. Like it's, um, you, you said something that, that I'm still stuck on a little bit though. You, you, purposefully expire your Polaroid before shooting it? Mm-hmm. Tell, yeah. tell, tell no. me more about that. I'm, I'm really curious about that practice. I... Um, yeah, it's not all the time. Recently, <clears throat> the stuff that I've shared recently, I think is about like just over a year old. So what I used to do, it's harder to do now, mostly because there's just 
I don't know, people on eBay or something probably caught on, but I used to buy my film in bulk and just let it sit. And I would just stuff it away. It's in a dark cupboard and I just let it sit there and I don't, I don't actually don't keep it in a fridge most of the time. Um, I want to see what kind of variables will come out of it. Excuse me. Um, because of the exchange of like cold or heat and, um, it just, it makes so many weird things happen to the chemistry. And that's my favorite part. My favorite part is to see those color shifts. Um, some batches have been better than others. And I have to just sort of trust that, um, it is my responsibility to make the most of those. And while it doesn't always work, it's not a perfect like system. Most of the time I can like figure out a box of film. And if I have, you know, five or six more, um, I know what I should do to my camera in order to make that sort of a consistent appearance. And, um, I mean, I used to stockpile so many boxes of film. I've been too broke to do it lately, but I have, uh, I have some like new boxes where I've been like, Oh, the saturation is just too much. It's like overwhelming. <laughs> like, I can't handle this stuff that I'll just like toss it in my bin and then rummage through to see what is the oldest date from when I put it in there. I just write the date on the box and, um, cross my fingers but I will say I don't do that to black and white film anymore the black and white film is so oh man it's so beautiful now and I I love the tonality of it I think they've got some really really beautiful rich tones and um, it's really cool to not have to worry about that so much as I used to and uh, the colors still I think for, for my taste just needs that extra time okay yeah, I haven't tried the black and white for a while, so it might be time to to give that a shot. Uh, Nick Collingwood yeah. has a question. Uh, do you have the same expir- expiration policy about milk? <laughs> like leave it in there forever and then drink it? No. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Cromwell says experimentation through fermentation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> um, it might smell the same. I mean, with, with some of the shit that they put for additives in, in, in food and whatnot, you never know. Maybe it'll be just fine. Right, yeah. I think Nick will be Nick will be pleased to know that there is some film that's in the fridge right now. So I'll see. I mean, I'll, I could do a comparison. I'll do a sniff test. Sniff tests are always <laughs> good. You just remind me, I bought a bunch of duochrome green, but now I can't remember where the fuck I put it. Um <laughs> <laughs> You're, do, you're doing my method. You're just unknowingly doing so. Yeah. I, it should, I should have put it in the fridge, but I don't think I have because I haven't noticed it in there. So, <laughs> oh, well. Um, I'll find it somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> but th- there is like a, a thing to that where it's like, um, not to get into like the whole Fuji Polaroid debate, but um I, I like your comments there about like, you know, it's, it's a very strong community and like, you know, everyone's banding together for it to, to stay running. And one of the things that I like most about it is the cameras have more character too. There's just mm-hmm. more interesting Polaroid cameras to use um, than mm-hmm. some of like the, the Fuji contemporaries. So I think it's really cool to still be able to use cameras that are like, you know, 10 years older than I am. <laughs> which is kind of funny to think about because it's incredible. I mean, beyond like my typewriter and books, like there are very few things that have stood the test of time that remain operable and, and at their, you know, at their like fullest capacity. And, um, that's, that's just so cool. Like, and the fact that people want to preserve that, that's so special. <laughs> and they want to preserve it not just through, like, you know, it's sitting on a shelf and it looks cool, but they really want to make it um, stand the test of time through its usage. And that's a really special thing. I think it's pretty cool, like, for people who intend to, hopefully there's still film, when people can pass these tools down to their own family members the way that they were passed down to, I think, our generation. And... Um, I don't know a lot of staying power within modern manufactured goods that probably have that sort of, I don't know, feeling element, truth, whatever we want to call it. 
Yeah, like I'm not going to be handing down my Mac M1 MacBook Pro to like, you know, <laughs> generation 20 years from now kind of thing. Like if it works five years from now, I'll be pretty impressed with it. Right. Um, or but, it might be worth like $10,000. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that because I really cheaped out and I just bought like the cheapest thing that I could get MacBook Pro on. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not even sure if it runs Mac OS. I think it's like Windows 11, but you know, whatever. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it is really cool. Like they're, they, they were just built differently. And the other thing that I find really beautiful about Polaroid today and this is something I don't think a lot of people take into consideration about it when they're like slamming it and condemning like its quality versus the old stuff is that it's still an ongoing experiment and yeah. they had to start from nothing because the bulk of the chemicals needed to do the old um, batches are super illegal and dangerous um, and especially since they're producing it in the Netherlands, which has extremely strict chemical standards, yeah. you know, it's, it's amazing that they're able to produce what they have been producing for us today, given those environmental limitations and considerations. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's just wild. Cause like, apparently there's like some chemicals in the old Polaroid that were like so cancerous that like even saying their name would probably give you cancer. Like, <laughs> Gross. <clears throat> but that's what made the color yeah. pop. Huh. I actually did not know that. That's um, not surprising, I suppose, <laughs> given the era. <laughs> yeah, it's... We, I think, you know, we could all find something that we don't like about everything. And the thing that sort of makes that all, like, feel very moot is just the fact that there's only one left. That's it. That's all we have. Yeah. Without that, none of us get to complain. So it's like, why waste? Why waste the breath when, um, you know, you could just try harder, <laughs> try to work within the limitations that you're presented, and challenge the artistic presence that I think each and every one of us possesses, and not to just like put it down because it feels less satiating than like you know a cell phone picture for instance like what's the fun in that there's so much more presence of mind that comes with this particular brand and um and i hope it continues to be an experiment because i think that they've done a lot of really good work and within that good work also has come some fascinating images that i really really love that wouldn't be that way if that experiment wasn't taking place well, and I think as long as we vote with our dollars, like we have been, it'll, yeah. it'll still continue to exist. And yeah, on, But I on that so. comment, though, uh, Right Angle had a question. Well, it's like a comment and a question. Uh, they said, love SX-70 black and white, which I have to get. There's a difference I've noticed when shooting SX-70 film over 600 film sometimes. It just looks better. I don't know if it's a brain thing or a real thing. Um, Probably a speed thing. Yeah, probably that too. Okay. Um, but then their question was, do you have a favorite shot from 2022 so far? <clears throat> oh boy. Um, I think, I think so. I, yes, I do. I wish I could like, I don't know. I don't know how to do this kind of stuff, you but I like, wish I could just like hold it, it up. Yeah. Just hold it in front of the thing. Oh, oh dude. I have, I'm not exaggerating. I have like thousands of these that are unorganized. <laughs> I, couldn't find, I couldn't find that thing today if I tried. But it, it is on my profile. Um, it, I think it's from about February or March. It's just a photograph of some tulips. And I set them in the kitchen one afternoon. And um, the light hit them just the right way. And it was such a quiet scene and I almost didn't take the picture because I thought, oh, there's all this distracting kitchen stuff. And the light was just perfect. And I took it anyway. And because the film does what it does, it kind of hypersaturated the shadows and it made that color of the tulips just pop. Wow. And they, I was so satisfied in that moment. I just absolutely loved it. 
And, um, and recently I took a picture of some cabbage that I absolutely love too. And, uh, was that that black and white so shot? That's people, on? Mm-hmm, yeah, that's really recent. I was, that was like a month ago. Um, <laughs> thanks Pete. Um, I didn't know that people would respond to cabbage the way that they did, but a lot of people felt very favorable for it. So that felt pretty cool. It is a good looking cabbage. And you know, right? It was a good looking cabbage. Twelve hundred people agreed. Oh my god, really? Yeah. Oh, no. you, you got wow. um well now now you've got one thousand two hundred and twenty nine likes on, on a cabbage. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah, cabbage cabbage win. Um yeah, that is I just actually yesterday was looking at the same cabbage because I know where the garden is and it does not look that good anymore. So <laughs> it was the right time. So you, you caught the cabbage in its prime then? <laughs> yeah, I caught the cabbage in its prime. Um, <laughs> I will say one thing about the black and white film, if anybody is like dying for a tip about the black and white film, it's obviously in the Northwest usually gloomy, but on the overcast days, I find that that is where it's like, it's like a chef's kiss, perfect tonality. So uh, you know, morning, evening, overcast days. That's when this stuff really seems to shine. As I was going to say, one of my favorite shots that you sent of the, the samples um, was the one with the Chevette kind of poking out of the, the shrubs. Um, I'm sorry, which one was? Is It looks like it's a Chevette kind of poking what out from it? some shrubs next to a dumpster. Oh, oh, I love that picture. Um, I have rarely shared that with anybody other than just popping it on the internet. Um, I, that was very old film and I loved how that green blue, it almost, when it was developing, it had the most beautiful magical teal color over the entire thing. And I desperately wanted to run home and scan it while it was in that state, but I was too far away from home to do that. Oh, and, uh, but still like that, the color of the of the greenery sort of melded into that car and that's one of my favorite polaroids i've ever made well, and i like how the red turned out on the dumpster lid too mm-hmm. kind looks, of burnt right yeah it's kind of like pastel almost mm-hmm. that was, that was cool. like i think that was like two-year-old film i have to go back and check but what's uh what's that's the why oh, oh sorry go ahead Oh, that's why I do that. That's why I do the the patience game with everything because then those colors, at least they used to. That that film is older, but um, that's my desire is to get that color. I'm gonna have to try that now. Aging, yeah. like you know, aging some Polaroid <laughs> film. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I cut you off, so I'm sorry. What were you gonna say? Um, fuck. What was I going to say? The COVID sucks. It's um, my like memory and attention uh. span has just been absolutely <clears throat> like shit slammed. And uh, it's also, <laughs> it's kind of annoying too. Cause like I have to do this from home today, which um, you know, people that have been on the chat before might recognize the background behind me, but I haven't been in here in a while. Cause I usually do yeah. it at my studio, but um a friend of mine is doing a shoot there tomorrow and I figured I shouldn't be sitting in there spreading my COVID germs all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> Before. That's, that's right. <laughs> Especially that's right. being that like, you know, it's, it was so fucking potent that it's just like a, it was like an instant, like positive, like it's, that yeah. was like, it was a sad moment this morning. Cause I was like, maybe, maybe it's over and I just have like the sniffles now. And it's like, nah, you're still a plague monkey. No. <laughs> Yep, it lingered. <laughs> um, yeah, fuck, what was I going to say? Um, excuse me. Something about a shot. Well, I really liked that, that shot a lot with the Chevette. Just, like, the colors in it are, like, some of my, my like, favorite colors that, that you see with, with Polaroid. Like, when it gets that, almost like when you overexpose Portra a little bit and you get that like really mm, nice pastel mm-hmm. look to it. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Like that's, I, I shot a lot of SX 70 because I found you get that color a lot easier 
with SX70 color than with 600. Like you just get, it's like a warmer kind of like yeah. less cold. It has a creamy, well, at least a while ago, it used to have this really beautiful creaminess too that I think, um, I don't know. It was, it was so uniquely SX70 and the last time I used them, I didn't quite get that look. Mm. Um, I don't know if it was just the conditions that I was shooting under or what, but that historically has been, I think, its signature. And that is so desirable to me. I think that color palette is that portrait of 160 is like my favorite color stock film. And uh, I totally see how you can see those colors between the two of them. Um, yeah, like it, it really reminds me of, of like a, a duller like Portra 160, that, that one with the nice greenery. Um, I remembered my question, but there's a comment here, so I'm going to table my question, make sure I don't forget it. Okay. And um, Instant Flamingo says, uh, your work is super connected with the Pacific Northwest weather and nature. How do the different seasons of the year impact your photography? Oh, thanks, Abel. Um... I hate summer. <laughs> That's probably the best answer. Why do you I, hate summer? Because I don't like to photograph during summer. <laughs> it's just too too stark of a difference from the the like gloom that we're so used to in the Northwest. I mean, I'm sure you get it up in in BC, and I know that he gets in Washington and uh, Vancouver is boy, gloomy brutal. as fuck. Like this this place is. I just moved back here like last year and I forgot how much I hated the rain after being in Toronto for like five years. Like Mm -hmm. I moved here in the Mm -hmm. fall and I'm like, Oh, this is nice. And then like winter was like, whatever it's winter. And then like the rain came and I'm like, fuck, why did I move back? Yeah. Yeah. It's like third winter. Yep. Yeah. It's like, I'm not a Uh, rainy (laughs) hobbit. Like, fuck that. I don't want third winter. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I think I think this is I love this question because the seasons and weather is like I think about them constantly. Like it's very much part of my world. It's not just the it's not like an external part. It feels like something I'm very like in tune with and, and connected to whether I want it to be or not. And um, I feel so much more motivation to shoot between like probably October through about May ish given the weather, but usually so I live on the coast now and um, out here because I'm at elevation, but I think we get a lot of really dramatic skies with our elevation here and therefore comes like a lot of crazy fog and the wintry sky and atmosphere usually lends itself to this medium very, very well, I think. Um, I prefer to be out when I know that I'm not going to have to worry too much about shadow. I'm not going to have to be basically fighting with, with traffic to get to the places that sometimes I like to be. And, um, once the summer hits, I notice that those fall away and that I, I generally feel rather indignant about <laughs> having to challenge myself to shoot under nice conditions. because I'm like, I don't know what to do there's all this light and I love light, but I love it in a very particular kind of way for this photography. And, um, it is, it is something that I, I don't know. I don't want to conquer it. That's not the right word. I want to appreciate it, I think. And I haven't, I've been in a kind of like a photographic rut and it's funny to hear this question because I'm realizing like, this has been the slow burn into summer here. We've had a very long winter. We've had almost no summer. We've only had a few weeks now. And, uh, and I'm wondering if that's contributed in a way that I wasn't really paying attention to because Mm -hmm. my sense of self within photography and approaching things from this artistic perspective where color and light and shadow and atmosphere matter to me a lot that I've sort of neglected to um, to investigate further how that could contribute to this rut that I've been feeling. So we're connected to the earth this way, you know, not just the, but passive. I, all of us are very influenced by it. And um, I think it would be a disservice for me not to, to ask myself those sorts of questions. Um, 
especially because I get bummed out and I don't get to photograph. That's fair. Okay, so there's one more question here, but I'm going to ask my question quick before I forget it because it just about slipped away on me. Um, what's the oldest film you've ever shot? Not one of your, like, um, uh, wine cellar, film cellar ones, but um, <laughs> like the, the oldest pack of film that you've come across that you've shot and gotten like happy results from. <clears throat> Ooh, happy results? Or like oh. unhappy results. Good question. Last year, um, I think it was last year, a friend of mine had a whole bunch of stuff and he found a pack from, God, I honestly can't remember how old this film was. It was definitely over 20 years old, if I remember correctly, though. I have it somewhere. I just, like the other photo, it's in a stack a mile deep. Um, and shockingly, it worked. It was some um, SX-70 film. I had to overexpose it all the way. So I turned my wheel all the way to lighten. And it was, oh man, it was like chemically and splotchy and it stunk really bad. But the blue was that time zero blue that is like, Ooh. oh man, my absolute all-time favorite. Um, and unfortunately, I was rushing because I was so excited to try out this stuff that I didn't even compose the photographs well. So like, they're like very mediocre, but they're, um, but the, the satisfaction of seeing something so old come to the surface, it took a long time. I think it took almost two hours for the photo to really, really come out. Holy shit. Um, yeah, it was, I actually almost threw it away because I was like, Oh, this probably didn't work, but I should just stick it out and see what happens. Um, Thankfully, I did stick it out because I had like five or six of them, and uh, they're nothing. They're nothing fun, but um, but it was such a great experiment. And I know going forward that even if the film might not work, that making sure to give it just as much like thoughtfulness as I would any other film pack would be uh, would be the way to go. Because you might get lucky, you know. When I always hang on to the like janky ones because like I'll use them if I'm mailing someone something I'll like write notes on them or something like is like yeah I, I always like find a use for them um, even if they didn't take a picture on the time zero thing though did you or have you had a chance to check out uh, Raymond Molinar's Polaroids book? Um, is he the one I'm I can be. I can cross names sometimes, so I apologize to anybody that I do that to. But is he the one who was shooting a lot of Time Zero in Morocco? I don't know if it was Morocco, but he shot, um, it, it's all Time Zero, and he got obsessed with Time Zero, and it was like after it didn't exist anymore. So it was like, um, I think it, it was a, a 10-year range that he did the book on. And most of the film he got like obsessively by just traveling across the U S and like looking on Craigslist or whatever and finding people that like had film. Um, okay. I know the project you're talking about and I'm the exact images I'm blanking on at the moment, but yes, I have looked at these. Like if there is a Polaroid book that exists, I've wanted to seek it out. Um, I've been going, the school here has a great library program where you can basically find any book anywhere and they will get it for you. And I have a list that's like this long right now of just Polaroid books that I'm very excited to look through that otherwise would be significantly too expensive for me to buy. But, um, I don't know if projects, the library yeah. would have it, but here, let me just grab it. Just a sec. Oh, sure. All right, so okay. it's a it's a film photographic book. Let me see. Oh, yes, this is the oh this is the one that's been on my list. Okay, and it's uh, yeah Polaroids, uh, two thousand seven to twenty eighteen, and uh, yeah, it's all been shot on Time Zero, and like there's just some that's the most that's the most beautiful one. I'm sorry, but. 
sorry, I'm a little distracted because my thing got, I can only see text on my phone all of a sudden, so I'm trying to get back so I can see you properly. Do you know what I do? <laughs> I'm um, sorry. <laughs> like, you can only see the uh, chat text, or? Yeah, and I feel like I can type, but I don't want to type, I just want to look at what like, you're tap on, <laughs> uh, tap on me, or tap on you? Like oh, just tap on you. Oh, <laughs> okay. show me the book <laughs> sorry guys yeah it's it's a cool book I don't know if you can get them anymore because I think they're sold out um, last time I looked I think they were but just the the time zero like the, these are ha- like, I, I would call these happy accents like oh that's my favorite when that happens you know who's like the king of that is um, Matt who does instant surf he has the most, oh man, he has the most wonderful results with Time Zero film. Matt, if you're there, I think it's late in the UK, but they're beautiful. They're like absolutely timeless. And I love that it's called Time Zero because the images that it makes are the most coveted as far as I'm concerned. I'm not familiar with him. I'll have to look him up after. Oh, he's got such beautiful images. And he also shoots um, 8 by 10 uh there's a lot of stuff centered around just surfing a um, little bit else that we get to see, but most of it's based around that. And it, I used to be a surfer and I live at the ocean and the ocean is a big part of my life. So I feel very like, I don't know, instant, no pun intended, fun, fondness for what he does. Um, he'd be a great person to talk to actually. Instant oh, yeah, surf, just posted so. it. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, let me actually, and Nick's also on my list of people that I want to get on the show too. Where is he here? Instant surf. Yeah. See, everybody loves Matt. For a second, I thought you were going to say Matt Day and I was like, he shot time zero. No. But I was going to say who? Matt Day. Oh, no, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> I like you. Uh, yeah, anyways, that that's more of like a beers conversation one than on the internet with the... Yeah, we could all meet forever. in person yeah. and we could talk about that. <laughs> Um, sorry, and Right Angle had another question. They would love to hear about photographers and artists, especially women, who inspire you. Oh, that's a beautiful question. Thank you, Casey. Um, if it's okay, I have a book right over here that I could go get and I could show you guys. Absolutely. Um, you, well, I'll say, so, Graciela Iturbide. I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. She is a black and white photographer from Mexico who, I mean, has made some of the most striking and underappreciated images, I think, ever. And it's not Polaroid-based. I I don't see a lot of collections from women, unfortunately, centered around Polaroid in book format. You know, there's like the Linda in the current new book, but... Um, I, I love to find different women who are photographing and um, look through books as often as possible. But this is one that I own because I loved it that much. So give me just one moment. I'm going to get it. Of course. Sorry, I was just like filling the dead air. Is that the price is right? You damn right it is. Wow. Well, I'm going to come on down and show you guys this book. Um, I think that this might be one of the best photography books of all time. Um, Not might be, but probably is. And her, um, her work took her into 
some of the more um, indigenous populations that still remain in Mexico. And she went in, she's a Mexican woman, and she went in with the hope to essentially like immerse herself and capture some of the traditional, um, I don't want to like muddle this because I don't want to do a disservice to how much effort it takes to be a person and especially being a white person, not speaking on their behalf, but, um, she immersed herself in a culture that I don't think any of us will will ever get to see. And she captured it elegantly and with compassion and, um, looked at the very like mundane quote unquote comings and goings of people um, throughout Mexico and made this tremendous collection of photographs. And this one is just called Mexico um, is one of the collections where she lets that really shine. She has another one called Prajo and it's just about birds. Um, I find her endlessly inspiring because she is willing to, she's willing to be really vulnerable with other people in a way that in photography I would like to, and I'm just not comfortable with. And, um, I think if I were, (laughs) if I were just willing to be like, I'm here, here we go. I deserve to photograph you. Then I might feel as brave as I think that she was. Um, but she did this too for herself. And I think that's the best way to operate as a photographer. And, uh, if any of us get to see it, we're just fortunate. And um, she she was unapologetic about that in her work, I think. And um, there's not a lot of other women that I've looked at the work of who I feel like, wow, they just went for it. And throughout her entire career, she just went for it. So um, I would say she's probably the female photographer that I admire most. And um, I mean, there's so many books that I take out that, I'm, I'm, I'm failing to find one that has struck me as much as this book did. But um, recently I got uh, Elf Dahlia, which I am struggling to remember the name of the photographer. I will look it up. I will send it to Casey. Um, but it was a really, really beautiful collection of photographs um, from northern Norway where folklore was more considered a religion than folklore and people were living in these particular ways that um, made for some very striking photographs that were very, very spooky and a little bit unsettling. And I think there's a lot of bravery in that to be a woman in particular photographing that way. Um, Men get away with it every day, but women often are told, you know, it's too much. And this woman did not do that. Um, I feel like I have a list a mile deep, actually. (laughs) That's really awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I love photography books, and uh, I think they're one of the greatest tools that we can utilize as photographers. Um, Not to copy and not to mimic, but to appreciate the patience of, (laughs) because it's such a tremendous undertaking to be a photographer to begin with, but then to... um, to set the intention of wanting a cohesive story um, or a not cohesive story. Who cares? (laughs) Sometimes you just want to slap them all together and sell something. But I think a lot of the women whose work I have looked uh, at and through and studied have been particularly thoughtful people. And I feel lucky to be a lady photographer because of that. It's a nice legacy to be part of, you know? Indeed. It is a very good legacy to be a part of. <clears throat> Sorry. It's the throat thing. Um, yeah, you're just making me think now that I need to have more uh, female photographers in my book collection. <laughs> I'm kind of yeah, lacking in that. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yes. Not that I have a um, very big collection, but, you know. Yeah. Even... Even if there is a library program near where somebody lives, where you live, where I live, anywhere, um, ask about interlibrary loans. I don't know if it's different in Canada or in other countries, but in the state, libraries that offer the interlibrary loan program will allow you for free to get basically any 
any book, any photography book. And there's just limitless amounts of them made by women that are so beautiful and in the sea of men who are often more represented than we are. Um, it might not be a purchase. These purchases are often very, very expensive. But um, I think just knowing that you've participated in someone's art that way can be very transformative and very moving. So um, I love libraries. I'm a little bit of a fanatic about this topic. Well, libraries need lots of love. They're very handy places. And uh, I think more people do need to take advantage of them. Yeah, when, when there's so many cool photo books. I mean, there's like so so many. <laughs> Radius Books has a pretty good history of representing women in particular. Um, so I would suggest that people check out their website in particular. So uh, you said Radius? Radius, yeah. Okay. They're, um, I think they're in Santa Fe or Albuquerque, New Mexico. But they have some very good quality stuff. We'll definitely have to check them out. Yeah. 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 Everybody run to the library. <laughs> I, I do. I need to get a new library card now that I'm in Vancouver. I haven't gotten around to doing that, uh, doing that yet. And then just, you know, with COVID and everything, you know, it's just been yeah. weird times these last couple yeah. of years. Going back to something you mentioned before on, on the community side of things. Um, I was curious, have you ever, um, have you ever gone to or you're planning to go to like any of the Policon events that um, the Instant Film Society puts on? Um, I wanted to. <clears throat> this year I was hoping I might be able to, but the cost of getting places right now is so extreme that I don't, I just don't think I would be able to do it, unfortunately. Um, but I'm very intrigued. I, I have a lot of thoughts about these um, events and I'm particularly interested in how women are presented and represented in them because so many wonderful women make up this community. And um, I think there's some safety in numbers when we can be in the same place at the same time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I hope then in the future that if I'm able to participate that other women are as well, because historically everything I've been part of has been a brodeo. And I think having um, a really diverse group of people to go visit in person and to enjoy this medium as a cohesive unit with lots of people represented would be really, really special. So hopefully down the line I can do that and hopefully more of us can be present with one another in that way. Um, I'd really like to see that happen. And if there's ever like a Northwest one, I'll definitely be there. I, I liked your comment, Brodio. I've never heard that one before. Um, <laughs> My I, whole life has been surrounded by those. <laughs> <laughs> I, I use photographers a lot, and I've noticed that more with like traditional film, kind of like clubs and groups and stuff like that. Is that there's a lot of like photo bros in those ones. Um, Instance Film Society has been pretty interesting because. My experience with a couple of Policons down in Texas is that um, there's a lot of female photographers that are part of the Instant Film Society, and a lot of the workshops were led by women. Um, yeah, so, they like, care about it a lot. Yeah, they, they do. So it was it was really cool to see that where it wasn't just like a bunch of mans telling people about like Polaroids <laughs> yeah. and shits. Um, yeah. You know, like, of course, there are a lot of men there because uh, it's just kind of happens everywhere but um it was nice to see that there was like a good female representation there especially in people giving workshops and and leading things i love that i love hearing that and i love that that's a reality and i've always been very um i i don't know i get touched and struck by the the inclusivity of instant film society they're um they, that I think leads with a lot of integrity and appreciation of the fact that artists come and all of us, like all of us are possible um, artists and want to be seen and represented as understood as such. And um, I think that they've really kind of led the way, at least in the United States with that sort of attitude. And um, it's, it's nice to know that there's that, um, that friendship, you know what I mean? Like, 
it doesn't feel like it's a separate thing. It feels like it means that it stretches to all of us. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it doesn't yeah. feel like it's like a virtue signaling thing or, or anything at all, mm-hmm. which you kind of get that vibe when you're at other events and you're just like, Oh, this is just so you don't get like canceled later or something. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. Um, Cromwell says, come to the Bay area one. It's not too far from you. Oh, yes. I saw the Bay area one and I was so intrigued by actually exactly what I'm mentioning. Like not a lot of women. <laughs> and <laughs> I, uh, I used to live in the Bay area a very, very long time ago and I tend to avoid it. I will be honest, but if it were somewhere North or South, I'd probably definitely go. Um, I really hope to see them expand. I would love to see this stuff happen more and more frequently in different places. And I know why they're in certain places and it, and they should be. Um, but hopefully we can take that sort of energy and, you know, I'm not far from Portland and I lived there for a million years and Seattle's right here and BC's just beyond and there's a million places in between. And, um, it's nice to know that there are people kind of all over the place who could help make that possible. So maybe I'll get to. Yeah. Well, I mean, if, if you're interested in it, um, definitely reach out to like Daniel and Andy and Armand and, and the gang that uh, run yeah. the instant film society. Cause that's how big area happened. Um, Brian yeah. Brooks um, came to Policon three and where the four. I can't remember. Policon three, maybe Policon four. And he just basically told them, like, yo, either you can be part of this idea happening in San Francisco, or I'm just going to, like, steal your idea and, like, do my own thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, okay, we'll, we'll work Either with one's you on good. It. Yeah, and, yeah. It, it, I mean, it, it, it's good that they're able to work it all together to, like, keep cohesity, or it's not co- cohesiveness um, with the, the community. And there are talks of, like, maybe having like a New York one, like a, like an East coast one or something. I yeah. definitely like to have something either in like Vancouver or Seattle to try and get like, you know, people from, from up here going like you know, Vancouver would be easier for, for me being that I live here, but also, you know, there's a lot of polo pals that might not have passports and stuff like that. So Seattle mm-hmm. might mm-hmm. make more sense to you. Um, yeah. Right angle says Polaroid should create a scholarship for stuff like this. It's funny you say that. So (laughs) Polaroid used to do a ton of financing for the arts. Like they were one of like the arts biggest benefactors back in the day. Like there were so many creatives and artists and photographers that were like either on Polaroid payroll or were just getting like money from Polaroid or product from uh, Polaroid to, uh, to do their thing and that's how Ansel Adams got his start <clears throat> uh well so Ansel Adams is actually on payroll he uh, was on payroll yeah so oh. um he got hired um because <laughs> he was like the Polaroid critic because um yeah you know Edwin would send him stuff to like check out and he'd be like it's kind of neat but it's bullshit like <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's the reason why type 55 got invented because uh, mm. he was like, this is kind of a neat thing, but unless there's a negative, this is bullshit. So, like, it, this is just a tinker toy. And they're like, okay, Ansel needs a negative. Let's make an instant yeah. film that has a negative. Um, and, yeah, he was... Imagine that. What's that? Oh, I said, imagine that power. <laughs> well, I mean, there's there's still a lot of photo bros out there that jerk off to all sorts of Ansel Adams stuff, which some of it's misguided. My My favorite is the... You can't edit everything. It needs to be out of the camera like that. It's like, yo, do you know how much Ansel Adams edited his shit? Like, if you saw his raw negatives, you'd be like, this guy's photography is dog shit. He had um, a tremendous, I forget which book, maybe it's in this, uh, no, it's not that book. Uh, There's like a lot of letters about this whole period of his life. I forget which book it is. I think it's Ansel Adams' um, black i think it's called like the black and white or something somebody else out there probably knows um but there's some great exchange between he and ed land about the process and his uh his experimentation and 
I love that he was a critic. I'm going to be honest. I love that he was a critic because just because it's face value and special doesn't mean that it's the best that it could be. Well, or, absolutely. <laughs> you know, and, uh, it, that, that helps shape things. And I think that's probably why they were able to do that kind of scholarship program, that investment in the arts. And I, I could probably turn blue in the face talking about my thoughts on that today. But, uh, I think Polaroid has a <laughs> almost a responsibility to to offer that to people who are dedicated. And I don't mean that just to benefit someone like myself, but that there's so many people who would go to leaps and bounds to make that a dream come true. And I think that they would turn out tremendous results and that that criticism could also be there as a constructive tool. And uh, I don't think we'll ever see that again. <laughs> Well, I don't think we would because the the problem is, and and this is what I don't think some people don't understand, is that even though they're Polaroid in name right now, they're nowhere near the levels of where the company used to be. I think like Polaroid today is, I think, less than 100 people or something globally, like between the factory and the people working in in the like office people. I think it's like 20 or 30 people that make Polaroid work. <clears throat> compared to like the Polaroid that we used to know, they were right. a, like a global force yeah. to be reckoned with. And the reason they were able to do all of those really cool like scholarship programs and investing in the arts and all of that was because they had hugely deep pockets from all of the defense contracting they did during World War II. Yeah. They made just buttloads of money doing government contracts and then yeah. just spent that money on engineering things on supporting art because they could yeah. and then they were like making money hand over fist as well so it's just like there was this orgy of money that polaroid had like you know through the 60s 70s and 80s that enabled them to do all these amazing things that um i don't know if we'd ever see that kind of investment again and like that was i think one of the biggest tragedies that no one talks about uh, during the dismantlement of Polaroid was the Polaroid art collection. I don't yeah. know. A lot of people don't know that Polaroid had one of like the largest like global art collections because all of these photographers and artists and creatives that were like either working for them or on payroll, like had donated work to them had made work for Polaroid and Polaroid had committed that it would never be sold it, it would never be sold off. It was like for the betterment of mankind kind of thing. Yeah. And then that was the first thing that the capital Beautiful. investment firms went after. Cause they were like, yeah. look at this. There's all this money just sitting here. Why don't you get in? It's like, no, this isn't, <laughs> it's not for sale. They're like, no, everything's for sale. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine that sort of attitude today. Like capitalism is, is a different beast. I suppose the same beast, but just with a different outfit on. Um, well, I, I think like, the way that Edwin Land ran the company, though, was it was really anti-capitalist. Like, he didn't really seem to care about making money, but he had all these really great ideas that just made money. And then yeah. as a result yeah. of making money, um, he was just like, okay, mm-hmm. let's do these fanciful things and see what happens because money wasn't really a problem. Like, um, in Land's Polaroid, there, like that's a really interesting book if you haven't read it about like what Polaroid was like under Edwin Land. Um, the guy that was tasked with making color instant film the first time they were making it, like he spent the first two years just researching colors and dyes yeah. instead of working so on it. <laughs> yeah, because he was <clears throat> he was like, if if I started working on it right away, I would have gotten in trouble from Land because he's like Land didn't want you to start a project right away he wanted you to get immersed in what he asked you to work on and like know all these intricate details and stuff before you even started day one of working on it. And could you imagine that? Like today your boss asking you for a task and it's like, I'm going to spend two years just like learning all this tertiary shit about the thing you asked me to do before I start working on it. Like that would never happen today. It'd be so cool though. It'd be so cool. It'd be so wild. That's a dream, but there's too many, too many cogs in the wheels and, and at the same time, probably not enough, you know, there's, 
Well, the ones. I, I, oh, sorry. What's that? Oh, I just I feel like there are at this point. I feel like I know limitless people who would be like, I'm willing to sacrifice the satisfaction of like knowing I've done a good job to experiment for this thing that I love because I believe in it. And I mean, I have a list that's like 50 people deep. <laughs> like, and that's just the people I know. I know that there's way, way, way more than that. And imagine the ingenuity and the pride that could come out of that. If, if things were just a little bit more accessible or I guess a lot more, I don't want to diminish like, the stronghold that like capitalism has over this whole, you know, experience as a person wishing. But if those things weren't there, I think that people could do tremendous things these days with this medium in particular. I think they'd be doing what he was doing. I really do. And I know people try, they really try hard. What we need is like some, some like rich billionaire or something to be like, we need to invest in art again. Like I was watching a TikTok today <clears throat> that cause it's like, you know, I'm 40 and addicted to TikTok, whatever. Like it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing, but <laughs> you know, when I don't, I don't even, I don't know how TikTok works. I'll be honest. <laughs> don't, don't even download it. It's dangerous. It will no, it'll suck to. the life out of you. Like it's, um, anyways, I've learned plenty off of TikTok and a lot of it makes me feel old. But this one was interesting because they were talking about like um, cultural renaissances and stuff like that. And it's just like mm-hmm. yeah, every cultural renaissance has happened because rich people um, decided they wanted to be petty and invest art, money in artists and stuff. <clears throat> so like you know, a bunch of theatrical stuff came because like, you know, this rich person wanted to like pay someone to make a play to make fun of that rich person. So they did that. And then the rich person got made fun of like, well, fuck you. I'm going to do a better play than that. And they invested in like, you know, whatever. And, you know, art investment, things like that. So these people are like tech bros. Put your fucking money yeah. where your mouth is right now. Like, right. you know, yeah. e- even if you like, yeah, cause they're talking about like indie filmmaking. They're like, you know, for eight grand, you can have like a really well done made movie kind of thing so it's just like you know why not like put up some of your money or if you don't want to be fully out of pocket like you know say hey i'm putting up like two grand tech bro buddies like you know do you want to like put some fucking money in on this shit too and i was like you know that's actually a really kind of fascinating idea is like there needs to be more like benefactors out there that are just like you know what i've got extra money and I don't really know what to do with it. You can only invest so much in shit. Um, mm-hmm. you, have, you don't need, like, how much do you actually need? Like, you know, why not invest in people? You know, why not just be like, hey, you know what? I got an extra few bucks here. I'm going to, like, throw that so, like, this person can get some Polaroid for a year or something. Like, that'd be really rad. Mm. Yeah, or just turn to the celebrities who claim to be bastions within this world and say we know you've got the dough yeah, exactly <laughs> why, Come don't on. You start, why don't you start programs and scholarships and and expand this opportunity to everyone because there is an economic burden and there is an economic barrier and there's i mean i think we could probably talk all day about this subject alone to be honest because <laughs> about it, but it would be amazing to see i I am disappointed to think that I don't think we'll ever see it. Unfortunately, if I somehow become a millionaire, I'll put my money where my mouth is and I'll do it myself. <laughs> I don't know if that's going to happen. Anytime soon. You just got to play Powerball more often, you know? Yeah. The two times I've played the lottery in the last like seven years, I unfortunately did not win. I've never won more than 20 bucks. And I've definitely spent more than 20 bucks, so I'm not really coming out ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, gambling is not my not my forte. <laughs> no, it's it's not mine either. But, you know, I'll still do it. I'll be like, whatever, here's 10 bucks every, like, other week kind of thing. Just with the yeah. dream, like, you know, what if? That would be kind of amazing. We need like, say, come on, Ben Affleck, Matt Damon, whatever, step up, spend some money. Fucking George Lucas, like, that guy, he's got money to fucking spend. Right? Yeah. 
I mean, I see dorky pictures of celebrities with Polaroids all the time, and I just think, God, you could buy so much film. You have no idea, like, the disparity that you're creating. <laughs> this is not, not an equal playing field here. No, not at all. And wasn't, like, yeah. Lady Gaga, like, an unofficial, like, artistic director? Creative yeah. Director. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah, that, I... I <laughs> is that still a thing? Like, cause I, I haven't heard anything of it since everyone was like, Oh my God, Lady Gaga is like a thing. I mean, to be honest, I'll say, I hope not. I don't, I don't think celebrities should be part of anything if they're not being philanthropic. So I just, I don't, I don't know if that's a good decision for any business. Um, I'm sure people will disagree, but that seems very over the top and unnecessary. That's fair. Yeah, <laughs> you know, right. I, I, I don't have celebrity worship, so I, I feel staunchly about celebrity things. What you weren't like totally enthralled with the whole like Johnny Depp Amber Heard thing as of late? That was just like you know capturing everyone and being like, "Oh my god!" No, I know very little about it. I just know that he's a scumbag, and I, <laughs> I just have like zero respect for most of these people. Like, I don't, your actions speak louder than any acting ability ever could, in my opinion. So, I think the only spokesperson, like, celebrity spokesperson for Polaroid I would have ever been cool with would have been Gilbert Gottfried. I, I think he would have been amazing as, like, a Polaroid spokesperson. Like, if he made commercials or something? Yeah, exactly. Or... <laughs> <laughs> could you imagine Polaroid commercials? <laughs> like, the like, Polaroid Go? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I could hear it. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like very cool and on board with like the 1970s like Muppet version of like celebrity integration. Ooh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. they turned that direction. I would be like two very big thumbs up from me. I but, would like that too. Yeah. Otherwise, just leave it to the people. <laughs> We're the ones working hard, you know. We're the ones trying to make it make it work for us, like. Have our input. Just, just check. Check in. Ooh, someone, uh, right Angle says Anthony Bourdain would have done cool work with his projects if he had a Polaroid. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I like him, too. And, ooh, what a good what a good combo that would have been um, for multiple reasons, too. Like, not just the face value of that, but I would pay attention. I would watch a show about that, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Rest in peace. Right. <laughs> that dude likes some good food. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, for most celebrities, this is how I feel about them, though. <laughs> <laughs> not winning that plinko. <laughs> no, no. They're they're not winners at all. Um, <laughs> I was curious. Do you have any... Or are you planning any book projects at all? Book projects? Yeah, of, of your own photos. Yes. Yeah. I actually, so the thing that I'm going to work on starting next week, my intention is actually to turn it into a book. Um, I have a ton of film ready. It's going to be a combination, though. It's going to be a, it's going to be like the first thing I haven't solely focused Polaroid with, but, um, I have a rolly that I'm bringing with me, so it'll be medium format and Polaroid together. And I think I might be shooting it entirely in black and white. Not positive oh. yet. Um, the film just looks so good right now that I want to maximize its like potential. And uh, I have a working title that I don't know if I should give away yet because the pressure of making a book is very significant. But I don't want to like let myself down and then <laughs> then be like here it is, but it's not. So um, the concept though is still that that first landscape and my um, my work as most people, but maybe not everybody knows, is centered completely around being in nature. And um, I know why that is because I grew up surrounded by nature. I grew up in the woods. I grew up away from other kids mostly. And, uh, it required a certain tenacity as a little kid 
to be present with myself and my imagination out in the world. And um, I want to see what that's like as an adult, as I figure out what, um, what the benefits and the drawbacks of that were, <laughs> because there are a lot of drawbacks. And, uh, and I really want to challenge with the concept of a landscape means. I think a landscape is, is people, it's experiences, it's, you know, it's the gutter on the street corner. If you grew up in a suburb or in a city, it's not just like a pretty horizon with a tree or some water. It's so much more. And, uh, I think we each deserve to, to understand how those things shape us. So I'm hoping that this collection can challenge that <laughs> and challenge, uh, what I know about what it is to be who I am, which is probably more existential than people want to hear, but it's true. Nothing wrong with being too existential. Yeah. Sorry. That's all I, that's like, nothing's ever like the surface for me. I have a very difficult time just being like, it's only going to be about dogs because <laughs> I just get bored. <laughs> I get bored with myself and, um, and there is still uh, a lot of playfulness in that kind of a concept so I don't want to diss that that would be inappropriate and totally unfair because I made zines that are just about flowers so what's the difference <laughs> but um, I have constantly a lot of book ideas I have about five or six different books that I would like to create it's just a matter of um, collecting the work and making new work to supplement it which takes so much time and uh and that time has a cost i suppose that's so very true hopefully hopefully this this project though will will kind of kick start the i don't know long list of ideas and hopes that i have because i really believe that books are important tools whether we make them for ourselves or we make them to share and um i have a secret not well not secret but i have a very like long desire now to start my own small art press and that is something that is very dear to my heart and I feel like if I can experiment with my own <laughs> books and I can experiment with my own projects um, basically without potentially letting anybody else down other than myself then that's a good way to start to understand just how much um, how much work I need to do and how much stuff I need to learn and I'm excited to learn that. Actually, I'm very excited to learn that. That's really cool. I look forward to seeing where you go with that. Thanks. Hopefully it'll look really good. Fingers crossed. I'm, I'm sure it's, it's going to turn out great. <clears throat> Thanks. And I'm also really looking forward to uh, seeing how this book comes along. Yeah. I, I, uh, I, coming back to the like summertime, like I'm looking out the window, like there's, blue in the sky and uh it will be a learning curve it'll be a challenge making this project which will be a good challenge that's awesome well i appreciate you coming and hanging out with me for a bit and sharing a bit about you and and what you're working on and uh i really hope you can make it out to one of the full cons one of these days it'd be cool to uh to catch up with you there and you said you're close to seattle I live on the coast of Oregon, so I'm just a little, I don't know, a few hours. Okay. Because I I know there's like um, a monthly coffee and cameras thing that uh, a few of my uh, Seattle friends keep sending me to to come check out. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Where does that take place? um, Let me look it up here. Sarah just sent me the list earlier today. Oh, I lost you there. I didn't get that part. Oh, are you still there? Yeah. I didn't hear what you were said. What, what you were saying, though. It's at Grumpy Bean Coffee Seattle. Oh, okay. And hmm. where is it here? Their next events are August 13th, September 10th, October 8th, hmm. November 5th, and December 3rd. And, uh, yeah, you just stop by the Grumpy Bean um, for cameras and coffees. And I think they do, like, a photo walk and stuff. Huh. 
Interesting. I will say I'm very introverted and I am always a little intimidated by these sorts of scenarios because one-on-one I do great. And then in a group I like, I'm like at the back, (laughs) you know what I mean? (laughs) like how do I get it myself away from this scenario, but not in a way where I don't want to participate. It's such a bizarre world to live with sort of like straddling the two worlds of. I definitely get that. Cause I am, you know, despite all of this, a, a pretty introverted person. So I, mm-hmm. I get those uh, feelings too. Sometimes where I feel a bit out of a place and big crowds and, and whatnot. Yeah. It's a little intimidating. Absolutely, yeah. Which is so funny because I because I like I really love to talk about this stuff. You'd think <laughs> that I'd be like, here I am. But most of the time, I'm like, I yeah. you didn't see me. I'm not here right now. Right, I come in disguise. <laughs> Maybe I'll do it with the disguise, like that guy who's that country singer. Um, oh, Orville Peck. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. Dude, that'd mm-hmm. actually be hilarious if you if you came up with like a <laughs> photography alter egos that you could go mm-hmm. to public event. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of am into that idea. I have a lot of cowboy hats. Maybe I'll follow suit. Probably not, but you never know. <laughs> well, you can't say it here because then people would know your secret identity. See? Yeah. Yeah, I got you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Instant Flamingo <laughs> says that they're nice meetups, chill, diverse, and just a nice vibe. Nice. Well, if he goes, I'll go. So. <laughs> I'm definitely going to try to go to one of them, um, either the September one or maybe the October one, because I'll be driving back from Texas for the October one, so I might be able to make that work. Nice. Yeah, I actually really wish I could go to the same Texas. I think it would be a really fun experience. Um, there's so many things in Texas that I would love to photograph, and the one time that I was there, I didn't get to. And uh, I'm a little, like, if only I could, like, pull it all together quickly. I have an obligation to go to a wedding I don't even think I could go to right now. And uh, I think if I miss the wedding to go hang out, just play pictures but I might get in some trouble (laughs) you don't want to do that and you don't want to get in trouble (laughs) yeah I think I would insult some family members who would be disappointed in me but uh hopefully whatever comes after that I could do because um there's some really special people involved with that program and and they've always been very um supportive of me and I'd like to pay that back by participating in that way so one of these days I'll make it Definitely. Yeah. Crom says, "Uh oh, you just told everyone." <laughs> what did I tell everybody? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what Crom's talking about there, but what did <clears throat> I do? Maybe about missing the wedding. I'm not sure. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now I now I'd really be in trouble because there's proof. <laughs> yeah, you're like, I don't want to go to your stupid wedding. I'll get the next one. I'm going to Polycon. <laughs> <laughs> It's not even in Texas fever because I'd have to really, I'd have to snangle some wacky stuff. But who knows? Maybe I'll show up in an Orville Peck outfit and he looks way hotter than I would. So we'll just, we'll just call it a day with that. I mean, I think anyone with tassels just, just looks hotter. Like yeah. <laughs> 2022, here are the tassel. Exactly. It just adds that mystery. There's just that like, yeah. Who is that person behind those tassels? You just have the eyes, like, you know. Yeah. Maybe just a singular tassel just to try it on and like see if <laughs> if the if the shoe fits and, and to uh be like how how's the mystique going, guys, and how inconspicuous is this large camera that makes a lot of noises? What do you think? Yeah, I like it. I live in a rural community. I'm gonna try this here and I'll report back to see how it goes because I don't think people would be very receptive. And I think that's maybe what I'm looking for. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to you reporting back on how that, that comes out. And, um, <laughs> you know, thank you for hanging out with me today. It's been a lot of fun chatting with you. Yeah. And I hope we can cross paths in the real world. Um, either yeah, one of the coffee and cameras or maybe at a Policon. And uh, I'm excited to see your book. 
So I'll definitely be um, watching your Instagrams for any uh, announcements on that. Thanks. No problem. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you to everybody who <clears throat> came to participate. It's very sweet. No problem. Is there anything you wanted to say to anyone before um, we, we do the, the wrap-up music? Oh, boy. I don't know. I feel very fortunate to be, you know, seen as an artist and to feel appreciated as an artist. And um, that was the only thing I ever aspired to be and to wish to be appreciated as such. And and I found it in the Polaroid community. So I feel very fortunate for that and very, very grateful. That'll never go away. That's really beautiful. And you are absolutely an artist and your photography is amazing. I love your photos. Oh, thank you. You're most welcome. And, you know, thanks everyone for hanging out with us for another episode of the chat. Um, join us next week. We're going to have Travis Candy on. Um, oh. Yeah. So that should be right. a lot of fun. And uh, if you have a pal or you want to be on the chat yourself, uh, send me a DM on the Instagram and let me know. We're still uh, working on the schedule for the rest of this year. And uh, yeah, thanks for hanging out with me and uh, my COVID forgetfulness. And (laughs) have a good week. Stay safe out there, guys. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody. All right. See y'all.